Come, let us gather with hearts anchored in Christ, ready to stand firm against the darkness. And this is In The Moment. I'm your host, Reverend Ricky Allen Jr. Thanking you as always for joining us on this lovely day the Lord has made and wherever you are. Whatever you're doing, I just pray that the Lord Jesus Christ is out front, especially as we enter into these uh, burr months, as they say, these lovely fall months. The, the weather's changing. The leaves are changing. It is my type of weather. It is cardigan weather. You got to love it. And we did miss you all last week. I was with my youngest son. Uh, with him in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, as my wife was in Hershey going to a women's conference. A very blessed weekend, a good break to uh, spend some family time. But we're back here this week. We're back ready to go. So let's get started. Our morning scripture comes from Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13 reads as follows. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you may take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. And we stand with God's armor, of course. But we also stand understanding that prayer is needed. Or have you prayed today? Have you got into your word today and spent some time with the Lord? If not, the time is now. Let's focus on God for a moment as we go to him in prayer. And of course, if you ever need prayer, go to get-prayer.com, submit your prayer requests there, and we're definitely going to receive them and share them with the masses here on In The Moment. So we all, that way we can all pray for you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you recognizing that we live in a world where darkness and evil seek to overwhelm us. But we know you are greater, stronger, and more powerful than any enemy we face, Lord. You are a refuge and our strength, our ever-present help in times of trouble. We, we acknowledge that the battle is not ours but yours. We confess that too often we try to fight in our own strength, relying on human wisdom when what we truly need is your divine power and your righteous hand guiding us. Today we seek the armor that only you can provide, the armor of truth righteousness, faith, salvation, and the word of God, the sword of the spirit. We, we actually clothe us in these gifts so that we might stand firm against the attacks of the enemy, strengthening our minds to know your truth, that we would not be deceived by the lies of the world, guide our hearts with the righteousness that comes only from Jesus Christ so that sin will find no foothold in us. Lord, help us to walk by faith and not by sight, trusting in your promises even when the forces of darkness close in around us. We know that evil lurks in the shadows, seeking to sow fear, confusion, and despair, especially during the election season. But we declare today that we are children of the light, called to be bold and courageous in the face of trials. We lift up our brothers and sisters who are battling unseen forces, who, who feel overwhelmed by spiritual warfare. Grant them your peace, Lord, your protection and your assurance that you are with them. Equip us to intercede for one another, to stand shoulder to shoulder in prayer, lifting high the banner of Christ, who has already overcome the world. Lord, we ask that you expose the works of evil in our midst. Break the chains that bind us, whether they are the chains of sin, addiction, oppression, all sorts of biases, and let us be freed by the power of the Holy Spirit. May we not shrink back in fear, but boldly proclaim your truth in a world that's desperate for hope. Father, we rest in the victory of the cross where Jesus triumphed over every power and principality. We stand on that finished work today, knowing that the battle has been won and we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Strengthen our resolve to fight the, with the weapons you've given us, prayer, your word, and the uh, indwelling of your spirit. Lead us now, Lord, into deeper faith, greater courage, and unwavering trust 
in your mighty hand. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our King, we pray. Amen. So we're talking about demons this month. That's what we're talking about. And our topic is when the wilderness becomes a battlefield. When the wilderness becomes a battlefield. Demons and demonic activity has been used throughout society for years to explain the behaviors of humanity. Everyone has, has heard at least one time how, quote, the devil made him do it. Oftentimes in the day's world, the demonic is romanticized or made light of. TV shows have stories where humans are siding with Lucifer. There was a whole TV show once upon a time that portrayed him as this cool, misunderstood dude. So before we get all excited and talk about demons and demonology this month, it's import important to lay out the rules of the road. First, people think they're demonically influenced when it was their own poor behavior and decisions that put them in the position they're in right now. They're living in sin because they have chosen sin and get mad when sinning doesn't work out. Then it's the devil made me do it. Well, you're probably saying to yourselves, well, don't demons make you sin? Your free will that God gave you allows you to make your own choices. And the choices you make leads you down the paths you go. No one wants to hear that part. That's the quiet part out loud. So when you decide you're going to act differently from the will of God and get the wrong response, you made poor choices and entered into a space that may have the wrong spirits. How does this happen? How does evil get such a stronghold? What makes people decide to kill their own children? Men and women turn against their natural function. What makes society advocate for sin? Choices. And these choices, yes, put you in the space where sin exists and where the odds of you being demonically influenced run high. It makes your odds of being around people who are not of God run very high. How do we get there? James... 1, 14 through 15, lays out the roadmap. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. This is where we are. This is what's going on right now begins with the presence of temptation and scripture says they are dragged away to the point where the temptation has been realized and sin is conceived which leads to death then when sin is fully grown it's causing all sorts of chaos that leads to that destruction of the life so before that happens today let's talk about our fight against evil starting here before we go all crazy about demons this month because it, it's october it's how it's the week of it's the month of halloween everybody's thinking trick-or-treating and candy and all those things whatever you think about that that's what's on your mind right now don't get holy now i like Reese cups before we get into talking about this and the origins and all that stuff let's talk about how you can cut off the process to even being in a demonic presence or how you can prevent making choices that put you in the space of unclean diabolical spirits. Jesus Christ has given us the model of how to do so. It's not a flashy model. It's not one that involves a fancy process, but you will win. And we find it in Matthew four, one through 11, which reads as follows. 
Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he says, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Verse 11, then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we only pray for this level of resistance. So many have fallen to the wayside because they do not keep first things first. They don't stick to the fundamentals of what you taught. And as a result, they've gone astray thinking they need all these stuff and things when we only need you. We only need our word, the word of God, which you've given us. Help us, Lord, dive into your word right now and say what needs to be said and do what needs to be done for the glorification of your kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. When the wilderness becomes a battlefield. We got some thoughts here. We're gonna, we're gonna pull from this to help you in a uh, demonology 101 core concept here, all right? This is not over the top. This is not gonna be some mumbo jumbo that you can't understand. This is gonna be core related material that God has sent us to show us how to deal with the evil around us. Beginning with the understanding, when the wilderness becomes a battlefield, the devil targets your weakness. Or in other words, temptation strikes in your vulnerability. Temptation strikes in your vulnerability. There were three things going on we need to look at. First, Jesus is alone. Second, he has been fasting, and as a result of the fasting, the physical body is weak, of course. At the end of chapter three, Jesus just got baptized, so he just got baptized. The Spirit led him into the wilderness knowing what was next. Jesus has been fasting, and now his physical body is hungry, and here comes Satan. When we're called out by the Spirit to a place where we can be alone with the Lord is where oftentimes we're going to find the greatest temptation to do something physically different. And God knows that. Notice here that Satan is tempting Jesus to break his fast, to break his spiritual condition with God. So to bring him out of the spiritual discipline of fasting, he tempts him with a natural need, food. He says, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Nothing fancy, nothing eloquent. He just produces an idea to mess with his mind. Look at the word if for a moment. It sets the stage for this entire text we're looking at today. In the Greek, the word if used in this context is called a conditional conjunction. It's presenting or expressing a condition thought of as real, viewed as factual for the sake of argument. It's like someone saying, when they want to get you to do something, to prove something, well, if you are a Commanders fan, then why are you not wearing a jersey? Stuff like that. Satan is basically saying, okay, for the sake of argument, let's just say you are the son of God. Turn these stones into bread. It's not just temptation we see here, it's provocation. 
It's an attempt to get under the skin of Christ when he's looking at it from a human standpoint, not a spiritual one, eh? He starts with the try he starts with trying to get a physical reaction. Like all those who are demonically inspired and influenced, they are looking for a physical reaction to break out of your spiritual condition. And that's because if they do so, you're not fighting and communicating on your level. You're doing it on theirs. The home field advantage, as they say. Temptation strikes your vulnerability. In this case, hunger. What decisions do you make when you're hungry and when you're not? I know my mind is different. <laughs> I think we can all agree we're pleasant people when we're not hungry, but very focused and snippy when we are. But here's what we do, though, when Satan goes this route. When the wilderness becomes a battlefield, the word is our weapon. God's word is your weapon. Fight back with the truth. Don't spend all this time debating the facts and figures. Fight back with the truth. It's right there. We have the most complete translated study of God's word in our lifetime. Far better than our predecessors. Why are you not using it? Because they get you lost in you. Hit you little tricks, as I always talk about. They'll say, well, I know what the Bible says, but what do you feel? What I feel is what the Bible says. But you got, you got to bring it to them. You, you just can't say that. You, you got to show them that what you feel is what the Bible says. Jesus responds not by debates or conversations, but by quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The entire verse says this. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. What we see here... In that, in that particular context of Deuteronomy, is God teaching his people not to forget him and to trust in his provision. There's a discipline here in the relationship God is establishing, and what we see in Jesus is that same call, the discipline, and what he has established with us if we choose to believe. If you are a follower of Christ, you have victory over sin through him, not on our own and because Jesus reaches back to this point in time to remind Satan this is not going to work because God's conditions on trusting him and him alone in his word surpasses a physical need the food will come and go but God's word remains the same Jesus chooses God's word to respond and when he does this he eliminates the tactic of being tempted physically so when Satan picks up what Jesus is putting down and moves into the same space of the conversation, we see now what he does next. He'll just use God's word against him, or at least tries to. Because when the wilderness becomes a battlefield, the enemy twists what is sacred each and every time. He will twist the definition of marriage. He will twist the, de the definition of conception. He will twist whatever he needs in God's word to turn you away from God's word. That's why we must study God's word. We must trust in it as it is written, not as we want it to be, as it is written. In other words, Beware of the subtle deception. What does that word mean? Subtle in the dictionary means difficult to perceive or understand. The deception will not be so obvious, but it is deception nonetheless. When the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. Verse 5 there. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourselves down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him. It is also written. Do not put your Lord, your God to the test. Satan moves from getting Christ out of a spiritual condition with God, the father to another temptation. Let's get him to break fellowship by testing God. It's about doubting oneself and doubting the God that you serve. 
You hear this when people test you in saying, well, if there was a God, that's a temptation. It's a temptation to make you doubt God. And just in case, make God prove his power to you and them when these people don't even believe they just want to destroy your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's all they want to do. They could care less about a relationship with Christ. They want to destroy your relationship with Christ. No one is going to sell Jesus to you. No one is going to do lunch and learns with you. Either you come to the point of Christian education, studying God's word, or you don't. Either you come to church or you don't. Either you desire Christ or you don't. But one thing you are not going to do is make me and make all of y'all out there prove or provide unnecessary evidence when you live around it every day. Because if you see one sign, you're just going to need another. And then you're going to need another. And then you're going to need another. And you're never going to really be convinced because you just want a bunch of knowledge anyway. You do not want relationship. You do not want to be convicted. You do not want to be moved. You just want to know stuff. And just knowing stuff is not going to make you any better in getting to heaven because you're thinking, well, I'll be informed. I'll be a better person. But better people don't go to heaven. They go to hell, too. Only by the connection through relationship, the surrender and submission to Jesus Christ will you be saved. Sorry to tell you that. Satan is sitting here trying to get you to move on his behalf. Either you desire Christ or you don't. Jesus deals with this later on, by the way, in Matthew 16, 1 through 4. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. See that? The test, once again. He replied, when evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left and went away. We know Jonah went to Nineveh proclaiming the kingdom of heaven is near. Getting those people to turn back from the wicked ways. That's the sign you're getting here. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Satan is no, it's no one. And those who are influenced by his habits and thoughts processes are to be presented God's word and nothing more than God's word. Because when they try to mesh with you and they try to, to tempt you into misusing the power of God, because there are no points to be proven to the satanic. Trust God, trust his word or be on your way. And it's about time we get to that point. Well, we just start being real with people. This soft, hand-holding, milk-drinking generation that can't swallow any solid food to save their life. God bless their little hearts. They want everything handed to them very soft and very gentle without making no repentance, without not even calling on the Lord. But they want to be handled so gentle, you can't, you, you can't be rough. I am. I, I, I'm sorry. Trust God, trust his word, or be on your way. Make a choice. By all means, make a choice. That's, that's, that's all. That's all we're calling for here. Don't sit here and think that you're doing anybody any favors by, well, well you know, well, what about this right here? Well, if there was a God, well, what about this? If you have to have all those questions answered before you simply trust, then you're not ready. You, you've already made your decision. You're, you're not in fertile ground. I'm sorry. Be mad. <laughs> Be mad. Or get right. Jesus counters the devil's misuse of scripture by quoting Deuteronomy 6.16. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. We'll see that in Matthew uh, four seven here, reminding us that God's promises should not be manipulated for selfish purposes. 
The verse says this, the full verse of Deuteronomy 6.16, Do not put your Lord God to the test as you did at Massa. Now, what happened there? Well, we're going we're gonna to go into it. It's a situation in Exodus 17 where the people were on the move and had camped at Rephidim and there was no water. And immediately went to the old trope of why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and our livestock die of thirst? Started panicking. See, that's in verse 3 of chapter 17 in Exodus. Later on, the same chapter, God commands Moses to strike the rock at Harab, and he names the place in verse 7, Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled, and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? This is exactly what sums up this temptation. Is God with you or not? That's all. That's what Satan is trying to get Christ to prove to him. He's a nobody. And if he is, let me see him. That's what he wants. Those who are against God are quick to put you to work, but won't put in the work to seek him. Let me say that one more time for you. Those who are against God are quick to put you to work, but won't put in the work to seek him. So when these people are exposed and overcome by demonic influence and get mad at God for what's going on, I always ask, did you seek him? Have you given your life to Christ? What is your relationship with Jesus like? It starts there. Some people can't tell you about, they can tell you about foolish demon stuff all day. You got preachers out here talking to the, 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 all this foolish water spirits and a spirit of this and a, a spirit of that, but where is the solution? It's at the cross where our Savior died for us, for those who believe we are covered by the blood of the Lamb. You're going to encounter all sorts of things in this world, but, the, and yes, they're going to be evil, but who are they to test the God that we serve? We know God is real. Jesus said, go and disciple the nations. Let's not add where addition is not called for. And here it is, the epitome of it all, because when the wilderness becomes a battlefield, Victory requires total allegiance. In other words, worship determines our outcome. In Matthew 4, 8 through 10, the devil offers Jesus all the kingdoms of the world if he would just worship him. The ultimate battle is over what or who we worship. That's, this is where Satan operates. What do you worship? Who do you worship? Verse 8 again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus shows that victory comes through undivided allegiance to God. That's why you got to avoid the spiritual distractions. You got to get in your word. And attention nowadays is limited because everything's a scroll away. We're down to basically watching five second videos on social media. Are you aware of this? The attention span is going so close to nothing almost. And I get it, I'm there with you. But we gotta give God our undivided allegiance. We can't get distracted so easily by every little fleeting thing that comes along that wants to be an option. This whole back and forth has been about yielding God's relationship with Christ on earth and heaven through fasting, proving to Satan that if, if he's anyone worth speaking to in the first place, and now kneeling to Satan and serving his kingdom on earth. And it's here where we see so many people fall or who are falling. Because it's too easy to serve it. Let's not forget Asaph in Psalm 73, where he says this in the first three verses, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. Why did he say that? He says, I had nearly lost my foothold. Here's why in verse 3. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He saw how well they were doing. He saw how they didn't have any problems. And he 
almost said to himself, it's just a, it's, it's one time, what could have hurt? One time is all it takes, people. Satan only needs you to turn away from God one time to get his hands around you, to, to put that, that chain around your neck and lock you in. How many times have you been there? I know I've been there. I've, I've seen it with my own self. I've seen it. I've seen it with my own eyes, and I've said to myself, you know what? I can't do it. I, I don't want it that bad. Think about how we see people making money and living their best lives on earth and thought to ourselves, I'll just partake one time, make the money and then leave. But we all notice like a drug user who says, I'll try it once and become completely destroyed by the choice. Completely destroyed. It's an earthly addiction that separates you from God. Just reaching back into your Bible and responding with the words of God. Here Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6.13, Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and take your oaths in his name. And we see, of course, in verse 11, the devil left him, and angels came and attended to him. Folks, the same can happen for you. We're going to be tested on every side. There's no doubt about it. And you can stand. And if you need help in standing and resisting, contact us by the information provided earlier in the show. We'll definitely reach out to you and help you also learn how to deal with demonic influence at its core. Not the demon itself, but the influence, where it begins. Let's start here. And that's where we're going this month. So stay with us. It's going to be great. May God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. And God willing, we'll see you next week. You take care.